Okay. Did you figure out how to share your screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you see that? Uh, can you see that now? Yeah. Or... Yes. Yes, we can. Like this. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'll be talking to you today about um, transfer learning across languages, um, essentially. Um, and I hope to make it kind of accessible as possible so that even if you're not really um, familiar that much with current methods in NLP, that it will still be interesting for you and that you can get something out of the talk. Um, now, I, um, we can motivate um, why we would like to transfer across different languages um, for different reasons. And I think personally, um, uh, one way I'd like to motivate it is by putting it in context of transfer learning more generally in NLP. And if you've been following at all any of the recent developments in natural language processing, um, where there's been a lot of recent successes in using um, methods to transfer or to learn um, from large amounts of unlabeled data. Um, and these methods are generally most useful uh, when the tasks they applied to um, share some commonalities and some underlying knowledge. And for language, that's often um, similar linguistic representations or tasks that have some similar structural similarities. So maybe they, uh, the tasks uh, both require some uh, reasoning on the semantic level. Um, generally, for transferring across languages, uh, we can see for the same reason that in order to transfer across languages, um, that should be successful because also languages, as many of you might know, sh share many underlying uh, char characteristics on different levels of meaning. And transferring is also particularly useful when annotated data is rare, which is often the case for many languages of the world where it's very expensive in general to, um, to find enough speakers on crowdsourcing surfaces to annotate enough data. Um, and from the empirical side, over the last years, as I mentioned, we've seen a lot of empirical successes um, uh, using transfer learning to achieve state of the art across a wide range of different NLP tasks. Um, and to give just one example out of a um, plethora of possible um, advancements here, um, you can see um, a standard benchmark in NLP named NTJ recognition, which just aims to identify um, whether an, um, whether a word in a sentence um, corresponds to a real world entity. Um, and here you can kind of see over the history of this benchmark um, the most important um, milestones or the most important successes. Um, and most of the later ones in like the last few years have been due to using um, pre-trained language models that have been trained on um, large amounts of data. And another kind of interesting uh, observation from this um, uh, slide here is that uh, most of the early advances on this task and um, generally on a wider range of NLP tasks have been due to better representations on the word level, um, whereas most of the recent advances have been due to better deep representations. So for instance, building on deep pre-trained language models. Um, and um, generally, there's been a similar trend for cross-lingual representations in that researchers also early on worked on um, learning um, cross-lingual representations on the word level. And more recently, we've seen um, uh, work uh, moving to learning deep multilingual representations, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and to give a bit more context of how uh, cross-lingual learning fits into um, the wider area of transfer learning, I find it useful to classify transfer learning based along different dimensions. In particular, um, in transfer learning, we can differentiate um, whether we, um, we're dealing um, with the same or different tasks between the source or the target setting. Um, so if we're dealing with the same task, then people have studied that on either as domain adaptation, so adapting from um, a certain natural language domain, such as Twitter data to another one, um, such as data from news. So bridging this shift um, of a domain um, uh, using different methods, or um, uh, as we'll be talking about in this case, to transfer from a source language, which is typically high resource uh, like English, to a lesser resource um, target language. Um, and similarly, we can also differentiate transfer learning in terms of um, using different tasks, in which case um, the main uh, the main distinguishing feature is whether we have the label data for those tasks available at the same time, in which we can basically um, train a joint model on all of the label data combined, or in which case we apply um, 
um, we have the data only available sequ sequentially, um, in which case we typically have um, have um, perform a step where we um, pre-train the model on some larger surrogate tasks. We have a lot of unsupervised data available and then apply that model to the tasks we actually care about. Um, but today I'm mainly going to be talking about cross-lingual learning here. Um, and with regard to cross-link learning, um, there is, um, I think it's also important to motivate it and look at the necessity to um, work on different languages from a societal perspective. Um, and in particular, if, you're, uh, if you've been using the internet and maybe you, um, speaking different languages, you might have noticed that depending what language um, you try to use on the internet um, really affects and shapes your experience online. In particular, if you um, we're trying to uh, use the internet with a um, low resource language. Uh, you would be limited a lot in terms of the information that is available to you, the educational resources perhaps, and even the connections um, you can make online. Um, and similarly, as uh, machine learning and natural language processing um, permeates society more and more, and as um, many more people will rely on using these technologies in their everyday lives, um, a similar divide um, extends also on the technological level. Um, and to just give one, maybe one current example here, um, probably less uh, current as uh, this example is more for post-COVID era, um, but if you're in a, in a big city such as New York and you're looking for a place to eat, you can and make your query in a high resource language such as English, and you're provided with a number of possible restaurants. Uh, you can make the same query in another high resource language such as Spanish and get a similar set of options. Um, but if you make now an identical query in a low resource language such as Basque, um, you're not provided with any options at all. And you can kind of imagine here, given that this is a problem for um, uh, for a European language, um, such as Basque here, and even with um, information that is, should be readily available, such as information about restaurants, how big of an issue that might be for most of the languages in the world, and for information that is a lot more critical, such as information to healthcare, potentially. And the solution or the general framework that I'll be talking about today in this talk um, relates to learning um, representations. And in particular, if you've um, worked on NLP or maybe uh, read classical papers before the deep learning area, um, a lot of work um, on classical NLP focused on learning language-specific NLP models and um, on making a lot of pre-processing or um, feature computation decisions um, for each language separately. And in contrast, now with the neural network um, toolkit, um, the um, and recently um, kind of, uh, an approach that has recently received a lot more attention is to instead learn uh, vector representations. Um, that um, share, that are sh um, that put words or sentences that are shared in meaning in different languages close to each other, um, and then apply a similar formula in terms of um, that has been applied and found success uh, in the transfer learning landscape um, across languages. Um, and this formula, kind of in general, um, is basically what I've referred to, uh, to before. Um, um, which starts um, with pre-training a method, a representation uh, learning method of your choice, such as word to back or uh, BERT, on large amounts of unlabeled data, and then fine-tuning that with the few labeled instances of your target task of interest. Um, and in the cross-lingual setting, um, we basically can apply the same formula with our current methods with one additional uh, modification. Um, in particular, we first have a stage where we learn uh, cross-lingual representations um, based on some unlabeled data in multiple languages. Um, and then in the second stage, um, so given that we've um, learned these representations in, in the first stage, and we've tried to learn these representations in such a way that they put words that are close in meaning to each other in different languages, um, close to each other in this embedding space. Um, so given these multilingual representations, we can now um, fine tune the model on data of a target task in a high resource language such as English. Um, and given that these representations um, should now contain some or uh, some generalizable uh, multilingual knowledge, um, 
we can now expect after keeping these cross-lingual parameters fixed so that we maintain this uh, multilingual information, this alignment that they've already learned, um, that we can now generalize them or uh, transfer them to new language without using actual uh, label data in that language. And in general, kind of this uh, three-step recipe has been shown um, to work surprisingly well in practice with recent um, deep transformer models um, that are learned on a large amount of data. And during this talk, I just want to go um, yeah, more, more in depth on um, what are the promises and the weaknesses of these approaches. And in particular, these representations can be learned on different levels. As I mentioned before, early approaches focus on the word level. Um, and this talk I'm mainly going to be focused on, on the sentence level representations. Um, however, a lot of the sentence level representations are inspired by work on learning representations on the word level. So if you're interested in those, um, there's a um, survey that I co-wrote with some authors um, last year that gives kind of a good overview of this area and as well as a, an ACL tutorial that we did last year as well, which kind of gives you an overview of um, state-of-the-art word-level methods. Um, and now for this talk, I mainly want to cover um, a couple of areas which I think are very exciting in this area of multilingual representation learning and cross-lingual transfer learning. Um, in particular, in the beginning, I just want to um, basically revisit and uh, look at more critically the motivation why we actually should care about doing um, cross-lingual transfer um, in a completely unsupervised setting. Um, then I'm going to look at what um, we know so far about what makes these um, met methods actually work in practice. Um, I'm going to look at something that has been referred to as the curse of multilinguality. Um, and then finally, I'm going to give you kind of a um, high level view of um, the strengths and the weaknesses of these current approaches on a large scale benchmark. Um, now, with regard to the, um, the first point here, um, cross-lingual transfer and a lot of approaches in the literature have generally been motivated based on um, two factors. Um, in particular, they assumed um, or cited um, the lack of parallel data for many of the world's low resource languages. Yeah? So that um, for many languages across the world, we do not have any signal that allows us to say which sentences in that language correspond to which sentences in another language, such as English, or doing that on the word level as well. Um, and at the same time, these methods were also motivated by um, simultaneously having access to large amounts of uh, monolingual data or unlabeled data in each of those languages um, that would allow these methods to learn um, high quality or representations of sufficient quality. Um, however, I just want to kind of briefly uh, look at uh, both of these two factors um, more critically and in particular um, show you what resources are available for learning um, cross lingual representations in practice. And in particular, if we look at and survey um, kind of the um, the entirety of um, cross-lingual resources or monolingual resources that are available for us to learn um, LP methods on, um, we can take quickly um, identify that um, first, the aspect or the claim that we don't actually have, uh, that we only have, we have zero power data for these languages actually does not um, hold uh, very much in practice. Um, in particular, there's been um, some very interesting recent work which proposed a very large scale um, multilingual corpus that covers more than 300 languages with um, a lot of um, parallel data between a lot of different language pairs in there. Um, so this corpus is already a good starting point for um, learning representations um, for some of those languages. And if your language of interest is not covered in that resource, you can also look to the multilingual Bible, which covers even more languages. Um, Albeit it only covers religious text, but it still um, can still be valuable in order to um, bootstrap or to find an initial alignment that will help your algorithm um, learn its representations in the end. And even if the multilingual Bible is not enough, they are actually large scale um, dictionaries. So um, lexicons that put um, that basically give you for a number of words in each language uh, the corresponding translations in other languages. And those can also be a good starting point um, for learning representations. Um, at the same time, for monolingual data, even though um, current approaches in NLP generally assume that there's um, 
technically infinite amounts of monolingual data available. Um, for that, for most of the languages of the world, that does not hold in practice, really. Um, so for Wikipedia, for instance, Wikipedia only covers around 300 languages. And for more than half of them, we don't have enough um, unlabeled data to learn high quality representations. Um, and even if we look beyond Wikipedia to the web, um, there are only a few hundred languages represented on the web in total. And many of our current tools, such as language identification, which two people typically rely on um, to crawl and cross those web data, um, is also only going to be able to identify a few hundred languages. Um, and finally, um, speech data is quite a promising, but very much unexplored research direction. Um, so if you have expertise in speech and would like to um, work in NLP or particularly in cross-language transferring, this is something where you could really use your, uh, use your knowledge. Um, now, so having said that, if you're doing or if you're interested in doing um, unsupervised transfer learning um, yeah, in the cross-lingual setting, then doing it for those two reasons is actually not that very realistic in practice. Um, so if you just care about downstream performance, you might actually be better off by using some of these um, supervision signals that I just described. Um, however, um, doing um, cross functional transfer learning in a completely unsupervised setup is still interesting, um, but for different reasons and mainly from, from a scientific perspective. Um, so if you are interested in working on this completely unsupervised setting, it can help you teach something about how different relate, uh, languages relate to each other based on their ability of how easily they're um, able to align um, uh, to each other yeah, based on their embedding spaces. Um, it can also be useful um, simply as a control setting to analyze the impact um, of monolingual data on your models or as a strong baseline. Um, and finally, for, for a few cases, actually, um, for instance, if your languages are very high resource, um, then this completely unsupervised setting or particularly completely unsupervised methods um, can actually be quite useful in practice because they're a lot easier to use um, than um, their counterparts, which, for instance, require uh, on lexical um, lexicon data as additional supervision. Um, so it can be something useful if you um, just want to quickly prototype something and check if this is an approach worth pursuing. Um, now, secondly, let's look at what makes these approaches actually work in practice. Um, and in particular here, I just want to give a quick overview um, in case you haven't been following the latest developments in NLP. Um, so in monolingual NLP, most of the recent methods or a core um, recent method that has seen wide usage is the so-called BERT, um, which is a large pre-trained um, transformer uh, language model that is trained on large amounts of unlabeled data in um, the language of choice using um, uh, the so-called uh, mass language modeling task, where you with some uh, ran, where you mask a random fraction of words in the input, and then try to predict the mask words in the output of your model. Um, and the model basically consists of multiple stacks of transformer layers here. And for this part of the talk, the only kind of the main um, point of interest here is that the token level representations of BERT um, consist of three different parts. Um, so we first have a token uh, embedding that kind of corresponds to the word embedding in um, kind of pre-deep uh, pre neural network uh, word to vector type methods. We have a position embedding that um, is a learned embedding of um, where the word occurs in the sentence. And we have a segment embedding that basically just differentiates whether uh, for sentence pairs, whether the word appears in the first or the se second sentence. Um, and this model then is pre-trained on large amounts of data, fine-tuned on data of a particular task, such as uh, entailment here. We try to classify or determine the relationship between a premise and a hypothesis, in this case, um, that they entail each other. Um, and um, this model has achieved state-of-the-art performance across a wide range of NLP tasks. And the similar model has been applied in the cross lingual setting with very little modification. Um, in particular, in the cross lingual setting now, instead of training the model on only one language, we want to apply it to data of multiple languages. Um, and the only modification um, that has, made, has been made to that end, that instead of just having a uh, vocabulary um, that only contains words in one language, we now share the vocabulary um, across all of the words in different languages. Um, with the main kind of side effect of that being that now words or subwords that are spelled the same across different languages would be assigned the same embedding. Uh, and the same ID um, across different languages. 
Um, now, having this shared vocabulary, we can now similarly pre-train our model on with mass language modeling on data of English and uh, other languages such as Spanish here. Um, and then, as we've seen before, given that we've now learned um, some multilingual representations in this model, we can now find units on data in English of a target task and then apply it to data um, of the same task in different language via zero-shot transfer. Um, now, people, when people first um, uh, apply this extension of um, this well established model in multilingual transfer learning to the cross lingual setting, they were quite um, surprised how well it actually worked in practice, how um, good this zero shot um, transfer forms of this model, which actually does not really. Um, learn any cross link information. So there's nothing in the model or nothing in the training that actually tells it what words in different languages or what sentences in different languages have the same meaning. Um, this model would still um, achieve very good performance in this zero transfer setting. Um, and the reasons people attributed to this um, quite surprising uh, behavior um, were threefold. Um, in particular, they suspected that having this shared vocabulary in the model um, would give it some uh, initial um, initial supervision um, for it to learn useful alignment. In particular, these um, the words um, that are shared between different languages with um, identical spelling. Um, it's a uh, quite a useful assumption, um, like many of these words um, do in fact have similar meanings across languages. So it can be useful, um, so it might be useful for the model to learn use them as anchors and then um, doing the joint training um, to learn um, uh, alignment between the languages based on this initial alignment that is given um, by words that are spelled the same across different languages. And with the last component being that um, the representations of the model have been learned were suspected to go actually beyond just memorizing uh, which words refer to or which words have the same meaning in different languages, um, but um, supposedly uh, were preserved to capture um, some deeper um, semantic understanding. Um, um, however, um, as we've um, shown in the recent paper here, um, actually in practice, we do not need any of these um, three factors um, to learn multilingual or to learn useful multilingual representations in practice. Um, but we can achieve um, basically essentially similar performance with a model that learns just a lexical alignment with disjoint vocabularies and also does not use joint training. Um, and just to give um, kind of a very quick impression of how this um, kind of alternative uh, counterpoint method looks like, um, it essentially strikes a balance between the monolingual bird model and this multilingually pre-trained method. And in particular, in the first stage, we just train a monolingual bird model as we would do it typically in the monolingual setting, monolingual setting using mass, mass language modeling on English. Um, and now the only difference um, in our proposed method here is that we um, now for a target language um, uh, that we apply the model to, we now just learn, we freeze all the parameters of the English model here. So all of the English parameters that the model has learned before stay the same. And the only parameters that we learn now on the new language are on the token level. So we just newly initialize and learn these token level embeddings for the new language with all the remaining parameters of the model uh, being kept fixed. Um, and now in the second stage, we just find in the model again on data um, on English. And here um, we just substitute back in the English token embeddings and keep those fixed in order to maintain um, any sort of lexical alignment that the model might have learned. And now test time in order to transfer it to a different language, we just substitute. So we plug back in the um, foreign language or the um, alternative token level embeddings that we've learned for the target language here. And so this case, uh, this method here is different in a number of ways compared to the previous joint approach that I mentioned. Um, in particular, the only um, parts um, that are um, that are learned here are essentially always specific for a particular language. So this model actually does not have any um, multilingual information per se. Um, 
in in contrast to this um, multilingually joint pretrain method. Um, so if you were um, kind of assuming that this joint training with a shared vocabulary um, was necessary for learning useful multilingual representations, then in this case, this model should not work at all or should uh, completely fail um, because all of the parameters of the model are either um, learned in English or specific to the target language. And the only thing that the model might have um, learned here is if, uh, if that was successful to align the embeddings in the target language uh, potentially to the remainder of the model representations. And in the paper, we've evaluated this method on a, uh, on a variety of tasks. And here, I just want to give kind of a very uh, brief glimpse and snapshot of the performance on one benchmark. And in particular, um, we've compared that to um, two of the state of the art approaches, one which is multilingual birch, just the method I described before. And the other thing um, is essentially a larger um, multilingual bird type method that was trained on much more data. And um, in addition, we've implemented kind of our own version of multilingual bird, which are these joint multi um, jointly learned methods here, which cover either 15 languages for the multilingual version with a shared vocabulary. So this should be more or less uh, corresponding to the performance of multilingual bird. And we've also looked at um, the importance of just training um, pairwise methods. So instead of having two uh, having 15 languages um, covered by the model, just training the model for uh, two languages pairwise, both with a joint vocabulary that is shared across the different languages and a disjoint vocabulary where the vocabularies in both languages are kept separate. Um, and if we compare that now to our method here and with two editions of um, learning position embeddings for the target language and um, just inserting some noise during fine tuning to make the model more robust, to when when we plug in the foreign language embeddings during inference time. Um, and we can see now that um, kind of our very simple approach that only learned these token level embeddings for the target language um, actually achieves almost um, or very similar performance um, to the original multilingual bird model. Um, so given kind of the average performance on the right um, and in particular it achieves um, basically almost same performance as the joint vocabulary method. Um, and slightly less performance than a disjoint vocabulary method. And the second thing that we can see here really is that uh, for the baselines as well, uh, having a joint vocabulary is actually not necessary. Um, but in general, what seems to be um, better here is to have as large of a vocabulary as possible. Um, and just to sum up, kind of the main takeaways from this section is that um, the method, even on a wider range of tasks, performed quite competitively. And um, simply learning this um, superficial lexical alignment, so no no deep representations that are shared across different languages, but just only lexical level or word level representations for each language um, generalized surprisingly well and calls kind of into, into question really what um, types of multilingual information or what multilingual information at all um, these pre the previous method of multilingual bird which is jointly trained with its deep representations on data and multilingual uh, multi multiple languages actually captures and um, to a lesser extent, we can also um, perhaps hypothesize or another surprising result here is that um, these monolingual representations from English actually generalize uh, or seem to be quite useful for the other language for uh, transferring to that. So they might actually capture more general representations um, or more language agnostic representations that we previously assumed. And now with regard to joint multilingual training, as I mentioned, um, having a shared vocabulary is actually not um, necessary in practice. Um, also training on multiple languages does not in fact help. And the most important factor really seems to be that you should have enough capacity in your, your, in your vocabulary for each language um, that you're working with. Um, and that um, can be a failing of some of these methods that cover a large number of languages um, because they try to represent uh, many words in their embedding space. And that really brings me to the, uh, the third section here, which is about the curse of multilinguality. And in particular, as I mentioned, in some cases, um, being multilingual, so having a model that was trained on a lot of different languages can actually uh, hurt in practice. Um, and what this 
course of multilinguality particularly has been used to refer to is a trade-off between how big your model is and how many languages it captures. In particular, people have observed that um, for a model with the same capacity, if you um, include more languages in your model, so here we can see a model with a fixed capacity um, as you increase the number of languages from left to the right and the accuracy on the X and Y task that we looked at before, um, kind of split across low resource, high resource and all languages. And as you can see here, um, the more languages we include in our model, the lower is the average performance across um, all languages. And there's one interesting effect here that, um, at least for the low resource languages, there's a slight bump as we slightly increase the number of languages, which results from um, the low resource languages profiting from some similar high resource languages and from their training data. Um, but even after uh, adding more languages, this slight increase in performance deteriorates, uh, deteriorates again. Um, and had adding more capacity helps to some extent. So you can simply scale up your model and it will do um, better overall. Um, I think I just got a question here. Um, yeah, multilingual bird can work for Semitic languages as well. So it's mainly about which languages are already covered or which scripts are already covered in its um, in its initial shared vocabulary. And as I think Hebrew is initially included, um, it could work for um, Semitic languages as well. Um, however, um, the same here for uh, low resource languages or generally languages which didn't have a lot of um, data in the pre-trained data um, assigned to them, um, the model's performance will generally be worse for those language, uh, languages that are underrepresented in, in the data. Um, and current state of the art models like multilingual bird or X language I mentioned before cover about 100 languages. Um, and uh, so now the goal really here, or the goal of this line of research really, is to try to bridge this um, discrepancy or this gap in performance between the quiet, um, robust performance on high risk languages and the much worse performance where there's about a performance difference around 15 to 20 uh, courtesy points uh, to the more uh, low resource languages. Um, and one way that you can try to bridge this gap in performance is by trying to um, allocate additional capacity for languages where the model um, has not been exposed to much or which um, uh, the model has not seen a lot in its uh, pre-trained data. And a kind of a nice way or one possible way to allocate this capacity is using a method that has been originally introduced in the computer vision literature uh, and which is known as residual adapters. And these residual adapters are essentially um, small bottleneck layers, so typically consisting of a down, down and an up, protect, um, up projection um, that are inserted between uh, the existing layers of your model. And that, um, and typically um, all of the parameters of your pre-trained model kept fixed and only these adapter um, parameters are fine-tuned on um, some data in your target task or your target language. Um, and in a recent paper, we basically took this idea of using adapters and um, applied that um, in a more general way to the setting of doing cross-single transfer um, to low resource languages. And in particular, what you can see here on the right is kind of a standard um, transformer architecture with um, different adapter layers um, added to them. So we can see kind of on the left and the right figure, um, a general transformer model consisting of multiple transformer layers um, with one of these layers being magnified to the right. And the adapters that we propose to add here um, are have a number of different functions. Um, firstly, we add um, basically language specific parameters, so language adapters, um, that we can use to give the model additional capacity to uh, more accurately model the particular linguistic characteristics of a certain uh, low resource language. Um, so these are just kind of added um, in the upper section after the um, addition and layer normalization of the transformer layer. Um, and these are trained with mass language modeling on data of um, those languages while keeping the remaining parameters of the model fixed. Um, in addition, um, we also propose to add um, task-specific parameter um, adapters, which is something that people have um, already used before for adapting these transformer layers. And in our case, um, because we want to keep all of the parameters of the model fixed, we need to add these task-specific parameters um, in order to learn task-specific information doing fine-tuning on data of the task. Um, and then kind of the other, um, another 
critical point in these methods that I mentioned before is um, the issue of having enough uh, capacity in the vocabulary to represent um, the words or the tokens appropriately in the different languages. Um, but trying to add new tokens or new words or entire new vocabulary for each language that you want to add to a pre-trained multilingual model um, is quite expensive because these um, token level embeddings have typically quite a large dimension dimensionality. Um, so instead, we propose to also add adapters that um, apply language-specific transformations on the token level. And in particular, we make these adapters invertible here so that we can use the same adapters on both um, and apply them both to the input token embeddings uh, here um, and then applying their inverse to the transpose or to the out output, which would then be uh, fed to the uh, output embedding matrix. Um, in order to save uh, parameters and to um, kind of enable better generalization at test time so we don't have to throw away any parameters that we learned. Um, and the nice thing or why I think this particular framework or generally think about adapters is quite promising practice is because they really allow you to do to, um, like plug and play essentially. Um, so because you can learn adapters for different languages and different tasks separately um, and then basically just substitute them in based on the current setting. Um, so here, if we are um, working with different tasks, we can basically just for one, uh, like once, one time, uh, learn adapters for English and then for another language like casual um, and for uh, fine tuning on particular data in one task we can then um, route the information to the adapter corresponding to that language like English um, and then a test time to apply it to um, by a zero transfer to data in different language we can then just substitute in the corresponding language adapter with the corresponding task adapter um, and this combination as long as we've learned these adapters could be applied to any language and any task um, and the particular interesting or kind of the uh, encouraging uh, um, results here are um, that the models, the adapters actually help the model to generalize um, quite a bit better to other languages. In particular, looking at uh, different tasks, I'm just going to show the performance on this um, standard NER, um, named entity recognition task that I mentioned before. And generally, if we just average the performance across all um, all target languages, um, we find that adapters help um, um, yeah. and outperform um, the baseline, which is XLMR, um, a model very similar, just larger compared to multilingual BERT on 16 out of 18 of those languages. And here to the right, we can basically see a um, the more fine-grained performance on NER, where we have um, label data in the source language that is uh, shown here on the left, and then uh, try to transfer the model that was trained on label data of that language to one of the target languages on the bottom. And as we go from left to right and from top to bottom, uh, the languages become more low resource and the, um, the languages kind of in the top right quadrant here are languages that we've actually uh, never seen doing pre-training. And here and um, in this uh, heat map, we basically just show the relative performance improvement. So wherever you see green, um, the model actually performs better compared to the baseline. And for the red parts, the model performs worse. And um, the particular reassuring of observation here is that for um, arguably the setting that is most realistic or most common in practice, we try to transfer from some high resource languages such as English to languages that you have not seen before in your pre-trained data or languages we don't have a lot of data for, um, there we, uh, we see the largest improvements with using these adapters. Um, we also um, maybe somewhat surprisingly see across the board quite large gains when transferring from Arabic, which might indicate the model um, that the original model struggles or maybe has not properly um, represented uh, the Arabic script in its training data. Um, and generally, if you look at, at the diagonal that represents the in-language settings, so um, fine-tuning a model on data of a language and then evaluating it on data of the same language. And there we also see um, strong performance improvements for all the low resource or unseen languages as well. Um, and lastly, kind of on the um, top left uh, quadrant here, we can see um, generally, even though that is uh, on transfer from two high resource languages, um, still quite competitive performance given these um, strong performance improvements in the other parts. 
Um, so overall, based on these findings um, and just the this plug and play nature of these adapter modules, um, I think it's quite a useful framework for general um, for crossing the transfer, and could be particularly useful for transferring um, these pre-trained multilingual methods to lowest languages or ones um, which are not actually included in the pre-trained data. Um, and so lastly, I just want to um, kind of end with a bigger and more like high level um, overview of performance of these methods um, just on a wider range of tasks and languages. Um, and in particular here, I just want to talk about a recent benchmark that we introduced called Extreme. And this benchmark um, was um, essentially necessitated, or we found it useful to introduce this um, because we've observed that most of the previous methods um, in this area has, have been typically evaluated just on a small number of tasks, so typically only looking at classification tasks and often under more favorable conditions. So looking at similar languages or similar domains and a kind of a benchmark um, or some way to actually assess how well these methods generalize to a larger set of circumstances, so to more distant languages or to more diverse tasks has, has so far been missing. Um, and that's why we proposed EXTREME here, which stands for Cross-Lingual Transfer Relation of Multilingual Encoders, um, which is essentially a benchmark suite of um, a number of existing multilingual NLP tasks. And the tasks we've chosen um, to um, require uh, reasoning on different levels of meaning. And you can see them here roughly ordered in terms of um, the complexity of natural language understanding ability that might be required to solve them. So we have comparatively easier, potentially, um, sentence classification tasks that um, re uh, require the model to make some decision between a pair of sentences. We have these um, sequence level um, or token level uh, prediction tasks, like part of speech checking or named entity recognition, which I mentioned before. We have some tasks which require the model to retrieve a corresponding sentence, similar meaning in the other language. And we have uh, question answering tasks, which basically require the model to read a um, paragraph and then answer a question about that. And for all of those tasks, we then give an evaluation um, of the model on these tasks. Um, we can then provide a combined score, which roughly represents how well the model generalizes to these other languages. And we've selected these tasks based on a number of different criteria. In particular, we've chosen tasks that are hard for current methods, but easy for humans to solve. Uh, we've chosen tasks that require different levels of reasoning. Um, OK, sorry, just saw this question here. So two rich morphological languages cause problems in multilingual trading. Does your method solve this? Um, Yes, I think we, I'm, I'm going to get to that in in a bit. So um, I assume this question was before for the uh, for the adapters. So the adapters, um, I guess, because you um, were able to allocate additional capacity for those languages and also learn some token level transformations, they might be um, allocating this additional uh, capacity for the model um, can help in morphologically rich languages, um, but it's still um, but in practice, there's still a problem for the method, and I'm going to get back to that uh, in, in a bit in terms of the broader evaluation here. Um, and in particular, for uh, we've also chosen um, emphasized tasks that are efficient enough to train, so, the, so that even if you don't have access to a lot of compute, you can still um, evaluate your method on these uh, tasks and the languages you care about. Um, we've also chosen tasks that cover multiple languages and that are generally easy to use without say, um, signing a restrictive license. And in terms of languages, we basically um, try to strike a balance between um, choosing languages where there's enough monolingual data available to learn uh, useful representations and choosing languages from different language families. And as a result, Extreme covers 40 uh, languages from 14 different language families and with uh, 12 different scripts. And the evaluation that we focus on here is really what I've mentioned before, the zero-shot crossing the transfer evaluation, where we have a model that was fine, um, that was pre-trained on multilingual data in uh, different languages. The model then in the second step is fine-tuned on the English data of, um, of a target task here, such as sentiment analysis, for instance, um, and then applied via zero -shot transfer to data of the same task in other languages. Um, and the nice thing, and the main reason why we chose um, this for the evaluation setup in Extreme, is because this is quite computationally efficient um, in that we only need to um, fine tune the model once and can then directly apply it and evaluate it on all other languages of that corresponding task. 
Um, and the methods we looked at here, um, some of them I mentioned before, multilingual BERT, XLM, and XLMR, which are basically all just variants of large scale pre-trained transformers, with the XLMR being the one that was trained on the most data. Um, and we've also looked at the impact of um, if, in case you have access to a translation service, such as Google Translate, of translating either the um, um, training data to other languages or translating your test data in other languages to English or also training a model on multiple translations and the impact that can have. Um, but right now I'm just gonna only wanna show a brief um, snapshot here of the performance of the best performing model. And in particular here on this um, uh, chart here, you can see the performance on each task of the different task categories at the bottom of the best performing model for each language in those corresponding tasks. And um, what is to note here is that the scores across the tasks are not directly comparable because all the scores here are based on the task specific metrics. And um, the human performance for the task where that is available is shown in with a um, red star and English performance is shown with a gold cross. And there's a couple of important observations that we can make here. Um, first, the model actually performs close to human uh, performance on English on some of the easier tasks, such as the token level and the sentence level uh, classification tasks. Um, but even for English, the model's performance is further away on some of the more challenging question answering tasks. Um, we can generally also see that there's a substantial gap in performance between performance on English and performance on the other languages across most of the tasks. Um, however, this gap or the, the range in which the scores are spread out is a lot more concentrated for some of these easier sentence level classification tasks. And we have a lot uh, larger spread across languages for um, some of the more challenging retrieval or token level tasks here. And one finding that we found particularly surprising was that um, the spread across results for the zero-shot transfer setting was actually quite large um, for these um, token level tasks like named entity recognition, um, which in a monolingual setting are actually um, close, very close to being solved with models reaching uh, around 93 or 95 um, accuracy or F1 score. Um, however, doing this uh, zero shot transfer in a, um, or doing uh, this zero shot transfer across languages seems to be quite challenging still, even for the state of the art methods, which might be due to these methods maybe not uh, covering um, or representing that well syntactic or structural information um, across languages, at least as much as it is uh, amenable here to extraction via zero shot transfer. Um, now we can also um, summarize the performance uh, based on the different language families um, of each language. And here in particular, we can see that maybe without surprise, um, performance is generally highest for Indo-European languages, which are typically languages which have a lot of data available to them and which are spoken in Europe most commonly. And performance is generally a lot lower for either um, languages with a lot fewer data, such as African languages, or languages which have different scripts, such as some of the Asian languages uh, we've looked at here. Um, so generally, like um, kind of to sum things up uh, here, um, still the tokenization, particularly of um, very different languages, and particularly of morphologically rich languages, where uh, which often have um, a lot of very rare tokens that cannot be properly represented in a very limited uh, multilingual vocabulary, are um, still big challenges for these current methods here. And just to give um, one example from a morphologically rich language here, and how this is handled currently by some of the state of the art methods, um, here we have a, a word in Turkish that refers to an entire sentence in English. And below you can see the segmentation or the subword organization assigned to it by multilingual BERT and the actual linguistic morphological segmentation as far as I'm aware. And you can see here that multilingual BERT actually quite gets completely wrong um, the different morphemes, um, and so the different prefixes and suffixes um, in the word here. Um, and so given that um, the initial segmentation of this word is already wrong, um, the model will have a lot of uh, more challenging time to actually properly represent um, the meaning of this entire phrase in the target language, which will also complicate um, transfer to these morphologically rich languages.
Um, and now just as a kind of in case I've piqued your interest and you want to maybe uh, train methods or apply methods um, to some of these languages, um, you can submit your trained models to Extreme, which has a public leaderboard. Um, and we've also made a number of scripts available um, that you can use to efficiently fine tune um, pre-trained models on languages or tasks that you're interested in. And the scripts are built on the popular open source framework, uh, Hagen Face Transformers. And there are download and fine tuning scripts that are quite easy to use that are available. Um, and we've also open sourced a number of automatic translations to many low resource languages. So even if the original data sets do not include um, label data for the languages that are interested in, you could use those automatic translations to analyze some potential failings um, of your model on some languages that you're interested in. Um, however, they, of course, do not replace um, the true gold standard evaluation data. Um, so with that, I want to conclude here um, with just a number of high-level takeaways, in particular with regard to um, kind of motivating and performing work in this area. It's very important, um, particularly when comparing to unsupervised methods, um, to just be explicit about what kinds of signals you're using in your methods, so whether you're using only um, unsupervised data or some cross-lingual or monolingual supervision. Um, as I mentioned before, a shared vocabulary is not actually required for these methods to work best. And monolingual representations actually transfer unexpectedly uh, well across languages. Um, in my opinion, adapters are quite a flexible way to alleviate and overcome this curse of multilinguality and add capacity for the languages that you're interested in. Um, and cross-lingual transfer still um, poses many open research uh, challenges, um, particularly how we can uh, effectively generalize to low risk languages um, or perform zero transfer to some of these structural um, token level tasks. Uh, and finally, extreme can be used as a um, kind of a window um, to serve as a glimpse into a model's uh, cross-lingual uh, generalization performance. And the code and the leaderboard are publicly available. And with that, uh, here are just some references for the papers that I mentioned. And I just want to thank all of you for your attention and um, to all of my collaborators as well for all of the amazing work. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Uh, it was indeed such an interesting topic. So we got some couple of questions, if you can ask them, if, if you can answer them. Sure. So let's start with the first one. Let me show you. Uh, OK. It says, in case we didn't have enough cross-language data, would transfer be, be beneficial? Um, yes, yeah. So in case you don't have enough cross-language data, so like um, cross-language data, meaning here, I assume, um, parallel data, so like sentence level translation data or um, word translation dictionaries, um, uh, you can still um, apply these methods quite effectively in practice. Um, in fact, many of these methods that I mentioned here in the end, so most of the um, state-of-the-art methods that we looked at here actually do not learn from any cross-lingual data at all. Um, however, I think that particularly for some languages, I mean, as I mentioned um, kind of very early on in the, um, in the beginning of the talk, for a lot of languages, actually, you do not have a lot of um, monolingual data um, available to learn um, potentially useful representations. Um, so as we try to tackle um, kind of really the uh, long tail of languages of the world, um, we probably want to use some sort of cross-lingual data. Um, so some translation dictionaries or even some like data from the multilingual Bible to help uh, and bootstrap these representations. Okay, so uh, I just got I just knew that we had a little problem concerning the live, but I hope it will be fixed. So uh, there is another question. It says, "Is there work that goes beyond characters?" Um, so beyond character, I mean, depends which which direction you mean beyond. So I mean, most of this work here is based on. Um, basically subwords, so not actually characters. So in, in most cases, you have some um, some uh, tokenization, uh, subword tokenization method that you apply um, before you actually train the model to your data, and that gives you a 
um, data uh, um, a vocabulary um, where words are split based on frequency information into potentially smaller uh, smaller chunks. Um, recently, th that has been um, kind of the the prominent um, word word uh, encoding method, uh, both on the monolingual and the cross-lingual level, um, and particularly you know, on the monolingual level when applied to very like or morphologically poor languages such as English works quite well. Um, but as I've um, like highlighted in the end, if you just use this tokenization for morphologically rich languages, it really doesn't give you a good um, encoding of your um, of your phrases. Um, so particularly in the uh, cross-lingual setting, actually going to something um, that's maybe closer to characters or some uh, linguistically inspired um, segmentation might actually be more useful. Um, but many of these state-of-the-art methods in NP do not actually learn from characters directly um, because purely characters, uh, character-based methods have been shown to uh, to underperform these more subword based, based methods. Okay, so uh, concerning English, there is a question here. It says, uh, in practice, is it possible to choose a different language other than English to transfer? Um, sure, yeah. So you could use um, any language, um, basically any language that the model was um, trained on, I, I suspect. Uh, I mean, typically, um, the reason why English is usually used is um, because for most data sets, you only have a label data in English. So um, that's also why we went with using English in the extreme um, benchmark, um, because for most of the data sets that we included there, um, the training data is only uh, available in English. So it's more just a convenience decision rather than something that is actually um, empirically the best decision, um, because in, in many settings, actually, um, you could, I mean, you can't see that directly here, um, but often it's actually more useful to transfer if you have labeled data available from a language that is more similar to your target language, um, because that will um, kind of make it easier for your model to transfer the related information. So we got, we got a question here from Hamza, if you want you can read it. Uh... Um, you mentioned that shared vocabulary is not required, but does affect the transfer, specifically when same words have opposite meanings in different languages. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess there's uh, like generally what, uh, yeah, th things like false friends or words um, exactly uh, with the same spelling, but different meanings. Um, and I guess, I mean, I mean, I'm not actually sure what the fraction of words that have the same meaning or that have different meanings in different languages actually is based on that. But in general, with these, um, with the jointly trained methods here, um, that actually does, does not seem to be much of an, uh, much of an issue. Um, although I think like um, based on these experiments here in my intuition, it really seems to be better to have um, kind of separate representations for your language because that way, I mean, even if they, um, even if two um, strings have, uh, are used, have like somewhat similar meaning in different languages, um, there are probably a lot of language specific characteristics that are not actually captured that well if they share the same embedding. Um, so generally, I think going forward, we'll probably see a lot more um, either, um, Disjoint vocabularies or um, token level language specific transformations that try to kind of add and add this additional information to the tokens. Uh, if you can, if you can see the private chat, he actually said in English it's eventually, but in French it's ev eventually more. So he's kind of speaking in the private chat. If you can okay. See. Yeah. Uh, so okay, I'm not not sure. I. Okay, so as an as an example here, okay, sure, sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think in 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 practice that might hurt, but I think in in uh, general, like empirically, they're so infrequent that I don't think that's like a, a very big issue for these methods. Okay, let's go with one more question. It says, "Does your method surpass the tokenization issues?" Since it's a big issue concerning those. Uh, um, yeah, um, no, so the, I mean, um, so the method here for adapters that, that I mentioned here um, is essentially just um, some additional flexibility for the model to maybe to perhaps um, 
adjust the um, the representations um, or the, the token level embedding that it has already learned, but it cannot really fix the already broken um, initial segmentation or encoding of the method. So that's, yeah, so this basically just applies to um, allocating or giving the model additional expressivity for the different languages, but the issue of tokenization that I mentioned still persists. Okay. So anyone wants to ask something in the comments? Here's the comments. Or I can I can ask you this. How can training a model from scratch help with performing cross-language tasks? Um, so mean like uh, so can you clarify what do you mean from scratch here for like um, using a training a pre-trained model from scratch or exactly exactly you use a pre-trained from scratch um, I mean generally like uh, in all of these cases um, similarly to um, monolingual transfer learning where you um, leverage or um, where methods have benefited from using these pre-trained representations, which already give you um, kind of very good estimate or good representations yeah. that already capture many aspects of um, language, mean, uh, language meaning in, in different contexts. Um, similarly here, the pre-trained representations that you've learned from Wikipedia or um, other sources in multiple languages already capture a lot of aspects that are um, relevant for um, performing um, a variety of different natural language related tasks. So they actually capture um, already yeah. uh, a lot of useful general linguistic knowledge. Um, and then because they've done that in multiple languages, they in addition can help with this uh, cross finger transfer. Okay. I think there is no more questions here. Okay. So thank you so much, Sebastian. It was an amazing. Uh, it means a lot, really. And uh, do you want to add something at the end? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's really thanks uh, a lot again for having me. I think it's really uh, great to uh, yeah to invite speakers and um, particularly in this case now where um, it's easier to yeah do this in a virtual setting than actually uh, doing it in person uh, in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I hope that going forward you just um, your yeah, your community and the community that you're building in Algiers, that you're uh, proactive about that. I hope you're uh, using this time to learn a lot. I hope I got maybe some of you excited about um, you doing NLP for multiple languages, because I think there's um, a lot of interesting research, a lot of um, open problems that I've tried to highlight here, and um, particularly a lot of settings which can benefit a lot, I think, from having um, native speaker expertise or even um, familiarity with other areas of AI potentially. Um, okay. Yeah, so I hope to see yeah more work from all of Hopefully. you, uh, either okay. in NLP or in other areas of machine learning, and hope to meet some of you in person as well at some point. Hopefully. And as I said before, you're such an inspiration for youth people. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sean, for this. Bitte <laughs> uh, schön. And, uh, and see you. Um, all the best. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian.